Oh, I've, uh, no, can I have we follow the? Okay, yeah. your questions. Your, your okay. Yeah, I'll be. Here. Yeah. We are live. Are we? Great. Um, so, good morning, good afternoon, um, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be to be back with you. Um, if you didn't have a chance to follow one of the panel that I moderated yesterday, uh, what we did is that we discussed dynamic competition. And the way we approached the subject is that we tried to study what's inside the firm, to open the firm black box a little bit and to see what is the role of a manager and how you see innovation growing out of what's happening again inside the firm. And today we're gonna to take the exact opposite approach uh, because what we're gonna do is to study the environment in which firms evolve. And of course, for the environment, you could be discussing the economic environment, the nomadic environment, uh, or the design in which firm evolves. But what we have chosen to do is to discuss the legal environment. And here, of course, if you talk about the legal environment and try to see how this may impact competition in the space, what you may think of immediately is the Digital Markets Act or competition law. But I think it, it is also important for us to study the AI Act and the thing we're going to discuss today, which is the Digital Services Act. So for the purpose, I am very happy to be amongst uh, friends and colleagues today. Um, we do have two of the world leading experts when it comes to data privacy um, and a longtime friend who's on the side of competition. So hopefully we can you know, create a bridge between those different areas of expertise. Um, I was about to say on the left, but it may be on the right, depending on your screen. Uh, we do have uh, Sylvia uh, de Conca, who is a um, assistant professor of law at the VU University of Amsterdam, where I am also um, located. Uh, so Sylvia, it's always very nice to be with you. As I was saying, we see each other online more than we see in person nowadays, uh, but it's, it's always great to be with you. Um, then uh, we are also joined by Mateusz uh, Grochowski, who is um, joining us. Where are you located, actually? Are you in Germany right now? Or... Yes, I'm in Germany. I'm at the Max Planck Institute for Private Law in Hamburg. Exactly. So I was about to say that you are a senior research fellow at the Max Planck Institute for uh, Comparative and International uh, Private Law, um, but I didn't know if you were actually there. So nice also to see you. Um, and we do have uh, with us Eduardo uh, Gaban that you know for being the organizer, the, the, the maestro behind uh, this fourth uh, IBCI conference. Um, Eduardo is joining us from Brazil. Um, and again, Eduardo, it's always a pleasure to, to share a panel with you. So um, nice to see you again. And so uh, the way we're going to structure this conversation is that I will ask them questions. Um, and hopefully we could first reach an understanding of what is inside the DSA uh, and then try to see if there is something similar outside of Europe. Uh, of course, we are very proud of the Brussels effect, the fact that when we regulate and do things in Europe, most of the countries will follow, uh, although this is, uh, it could be also you know, a, a bad thing, but th this is the way it is. And so I'm curious to hear from Eduardo as to whether there is something common in Brazil or something different. And then I'm gonna try my best to see how this may impact competition or at least competitive dynamics. So without further ado, I do have a, a uh, trick question to start with for both of you, Sylvia and Mateus. And the question is the following. What is the single best thing with the DSA? And also what is the single worst thing about the DSA? So Sylvia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me today, Eduardo and Tibolt. Um, I would say that the best thing of the DSA is that it introduces two obligations, the right of redress and the uh, transparency obligations for the online platforms. Both are very helpful for the users and for public authority to keep an eye on <laughs> what is going on inside the platform and at the same time to users because when something is taken down, it can be very unpleasant and it's good to have a right to redress. The bad thing, I would say, the definitions are incredibly complicated to navigate, and I am afraid that that might immediately create, because they're the first thing that comes when you read the, 
uh, the piece of legislation, they might create some disheartening or <laughs> discouraging feelings <laughs> in an average reader or even some of the experts that need to navigate them. All right, yes, I mean, you know, I remember that night when we got both the DSA and the DMA, um, and suddenly you had 200 pages to, to process, uh, and it took quite a few months, right? And every time you read the DSA or the DMA, as a matter of fact, you discover something new. Uh, so I imagine that Absolutely. if you are not an expert in the field, this may create, you know, some sort of fear. Uh, Matthias, do you, do, you share, do you share the same view? Uh, it would be actually very interesting if you were to say that the single worst thing, according to Sylvia, is actually the best in your opinion, but maybe that is not the case. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tibo. Thank you, thank you Eduardo, as well, for, the, for, for having me here, for this invite and for giving me a chance to share a few thoughts about the DSA and, and regulation of the, of the platform economy. So yeah, so I I, I think I, I agree with Sylvia on, on, the fir- like on both points. And I would like to add two more. So first of all, I agree that it's uh, definitely very good that DSA is introducing those two sort of like supervisory rights over the platform economy that allow to somehow look beyond the veil and, and understand what's really happening inside the platform, which is especially very interesting for from the perspective of how platforms handle the data, how platforms process certain information. Also, to some extent, but this is, I think, an open question right now, and, and let's see how it, how it works in practice. These instruments can be also used to somehow open this black box of the algorithms used by the platforms. Although here I'm slightly skeptical to what extent it's just a wishful thinking that we can really force platforms to, to, to reveal the architecture of algorithms. And to what extent this knowledge about how the algorithms are, 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 are construed can really help us to understand whether, for example, consumers or users of social media platforms are discriminated, are treated unfairly, and so far. But it's a, it's a separate issue. I would say that um, the second very positive side of the SA, to put it maybe a bit ironically, is the fact that it exists at all. Because I think it's very, it's a very bold move of the European Commission to, to, to propose this package of, of, of regulations, so DMA and DSA together, and to f- frame DSA in a way that tries to tackle upon the problems that everybody knew for a long time that are, are out there, are on the market, are in the platform economy, are in the social media. But many people were very hesitant to propose any particular fully framed policy proposals on how to how to address them how to tackle them so i think it's uh, it's a very interesting proposal it's it's a definitely a step to, in a very good direction of course we can we can argue about particular details but this is definitely something something very positive about the european commission that i think european commission european union right now is a kind of a leader in terms of in terms of identifying and addressing the <clears throat> new threats for individuals, for consumers, for citizens in the uh, online, on the on the online market, in the online economy. Speaking of the negative sides, I again I must agree with Celia that definitions are a very weak spot of this of, of, of DSA because uh, they are very complex. They are very vague. Partly, uh, we can think either of the threat of applying DSA to broadly and also to narrowly. So, so it is possible that certain domestic enforcers like courts mm-hmm. or administrative authorities or certain platforms will try to somehow build on those definitions in order to limit the scope of, of application of DSA. And also some member states have already uh, announced in response to DMA and DSA that they are quite dissatisfied with the scope of those acts and that they would uh, rather put more emphasis on the sovereign individual policy making yeah. at the domestic level. So I think the more vague those regulations at the EU level are, the more room for, let's say, this power play between Brussels and uh, domestic enforcers, domestic regulators is left there. 
And I think the other um, weakness of DSA I see is that DSA is very laconic in terms of remedies and in terms of enforcement. So this fear is left mostly to member states. And here again, looking at, for example, how the existing regulation in, in European consumer law or the European uh, digital market um, sphere, like provisions in, in, in the sphere of the, of the, of the EU law, how, how those acts are, are enforced at the domestic level. We see lots of incoherence. We see lots of misunderstanding for the specificity of, of the digital market. And I think this may be also a very like material threat to, to effectiveness of the SA as the this kind of like pan-European regulatory framework. You know, regarding regarding the subject, it's funny because you we've heard from the European Commission that they feared that it will fragment the digital single markets because each country will go in separate directions. And that is why they wanted, you know, to concentrate enforcement at the European Commission. But actually, because of what you explain is that, you know, by not having a DSA, which is very clear, it might actually open room for those member states and the willingness to intervene once again. But may, 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 before I move on to you, Eduardo, I, I want to ask a follow-up question, but actually to Sylvia, uh, because I think this idea, and I, and I saw that you agreed with the idea that the sole fact that the DSA exists is actually positive. But my question is, do you think it is coming at the right time? Is it coming two years too late? Or is it coming two years too you know, ahead of its time? What is your personal impression? So Sylvia. Yeah. It is tempting to say that it might be coming late. There is always the, the general uh, perception that the law somehow is lagging behind the technological or the market. Uh, advancements, but I'm always a little bit skeptical of that because the law has its own timing and the Euro in the European Union, going arriving too early might mean that then in five or 10 years, you have a bigger problem in terms of harmonization or in terms of effectiveness or in terms of political balance and stability. So yeah. I think that when it arrives, it's a good, it's the moment that it's mature in the cultural and political riverbed in Europe. Could have been, could have come earlier, maybe. Um, I am more worried about how long it's gonna take now. <laughs> yeah. Meaning that the procedure in Europe uh, sees a lot of actors involved and uh, the experience, for example, with the e-privacy regulation that was supposed to come into effect in, in 2018, and it has recently found uh, um, uh, an agreement on its hopefully definitive text last yeah. year. <laughs> so, so you know now the, it's going to be more risky. Yes. So the French are going to take the presidency of the Council of Europe, and they say they won't leave office before the DSA and the DMA being, you know, acted. Uh, we'll see about that. But I was attending a conference last week in the UK and, and someone was indeed saying, well, it's too bad that the law is lagging behind and, you know, it's taking too long. And then someone asked, OK, but then in which case would you say that it would have been better not to ensure procedural fairness and that, you know, all the parties can actually have the time to say what they have to say? And of course, it's really hard to answer this question, if not impossible. So a very interesting question. But now let me move on to you, Eduardo. Um, I'm curious as to whether there is anything similar in Brazil. Uh, have you, is there something that exists already? Have you heard about, you know, a similar regulation that might be coming? Uh, what, what's happening? Yeah, of course. Uh, well, thank, first of all, it's uh, an honor for me to be uh, with such a, a wonderful uh, professionals, professors, etc., including Thibault, that apart from being a friend, is a great guy, great professor. And, well, Yes, uh, I think there are some some movements that, that we can see some similarities uh, with the GSA and the GMA, but DSA mainly speaking, uh, I would I would highlight uh, three three of them right actually, one is in force uh, and it entered in force last year. That is our general data protection law mm -hmm. that deals uh, at some extent to uh, to privacy, of course, to privacy and data protection, but they it shifts a little uh, the burden uh, for, uh, for, uh, and it's not very well clear in, the, in this law, but uh, you can construe it in a way that the owner of the platforms, they are liable 
at some extent uh, to what they convey in the platform, uh, mainly if they don't respect privacy and, and uh, sensitive personal data. It's nice. And we just saw a, a constitutional amendment passed, uh, I mean, two weeks ago, uh, raising the uh, personal data and the privacy to con the constitutional level, uh, which is an achievement in the country because uh, it, 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 it strengthens a lot these two uh, rights and, and and this movement gave to these rights like a kind of a golden uh, background, right? In, uh, and in terms of importance to the individual here. And it ultimately strengthens the, the authority in charge of enforcing them, uh, the ANPG, the, the National Authority for Data Protection. And we have another, uh, another um, project uh, ongoing in the legislative process of fake news. And this, this is under a huge debate, um, many, many sides of the, the debate, you know, yep. many lobbying. And I'm not sure if it's going to be passed, if we will see it, it passing soon, because it's, uh, I mean, we are about to begin an election year for presidency, the federal level. And it's this project strictly related to the elections. Last our last elections, our last election uh, basically uh, led this current president uh, to be there because of the internet and the and the news and the media in the, through the internet. And there are some people that they think that the fake news helped the, the current president. Uh, I don't agree, uh, but this there is this debate ongoing. But so I think I see these three, uh, these three uh, uh, diplomas. I mean, it's going to run in force. The constitutional amendment about to be in force in yeah. the next week or so, and this project ongoing. Very let, interesting. Let, let me ask you a follow up question because you are also a practitioner, and um, I'm curious as to when you advise clients as uh, you know located in Brazil. Are they considering just the laws in Brazil, or are they asking you questions about, you know, GDPR and the things that we have in Europe, and maybe the regulations in the US? What's what's their view on it, on that? That's a good question. If the client has business outside, they always need to 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 know uh, the level of exposure and the rights and the you know um, the risks in the US and the EU. Always. Okay, interesting. Uh, so again, the Brussels effect is very much life. Uh, let me now turn on back to you, Sylvia, because I've been talking a bit, a bit about the DMA already. And of course, they've been introduced at the exact same time. And it looks like they were, you know, drafted by the same people and that there is a, you know, beautiful coherence between the two. Doing some very basic NLP analysis, I could see that the length of the sentences was different. The language was different also. The sentiment of those two bodies of laws was also different. And if you look at what's inside, I, I think you can make the point that they are very different. Um, as Matthias has been discussing, the DSA has you know, this idea to try to decentralize enforcement a bit, when in fact the DMA is just for the European Commission. The national competition agencies are not too happy about that, but that's one difference. It seems to me that the DMA has this idea that the small is beautiful, uh, when in fact the DSA wouldn't do, you know, wouldn't say big is beautiful, but would say big is easier to regulate. And in fact, you do have this table in which you see, depending on the size of the companies, that the bigger you are, the more obligations. So, you know, if you try to, as Eduardo was mentioning, prevent fake news, it might be easier potentially if you only have one news organization in a country. Although for democratic reason, this might be a nightmare. But then, if you have you know small players all over the place, and so um, that my question to you is. Do you do you agree with this analysis? Do you see the two as being different in nature? Um, and what do you think about this idea of decentralization when it comes to the enforcement of the DSA? Is it good? Is it bad? Can we improve it, knowing that, of course, the two are still, you know, a draft as we speak? Um, well, yes, they're definitely different. And 
I'm quite happy about it, if I have to be honest, because um, I wouldn't want someone that is an expert in digital rights and uh, protection of the individual to work on the market aspects and vice versa. <laughs> I want them to talk to each other, but they need to ha have a firm grip of their own <laughs> fields. And truth is, the DSA and the DMA are complementary. I mean, they're all, the platforms are operating on two sides of, sided economies. So yep. obviously the DSA is covering the side for the individual and consumers and the DMA is covering the other business. This requires different tools, even if we're trying to coordinate them because they are revolving around platforms. So they need to work together. They need to be considered a package. I totally agree with that. The difference is, uh, I do think that the... Um, what you what you were pointing out the decentralization versus instead a firmer um, grip in the hands of the European Union of the markets are justifiable considering the two fields mm. regarding the decentralization in the DSA I think what they're doing is they are replicating the system of the GDPR mm. that had the European that has the European data protect uh, the European the EDPB the European Data Protection Board uh, supervising the national data protection authorities and the national data protection authorities then become somehow the initial point of contact for the citizens the reason why it has it and it's necessary is because we're talking about individual rights and the companies that need to comply with the obligation on the dsa in the future will have to do so because there is a protection of individual rights and leaving this in the, man, in the hands and, and as a matter of the national states allows, for example, to consider cultural variables, allows to consider the constitutional uh, overall um, assets, the constitutional uh, balances that each nation has, because we are working with uh, civil rights and fundamental rights. It's very difficult otherwise. I see that less in the market, less than necessity. But, <laughs> you know, I was smiling because somehow some of your statements are very controversial in the space of competition law. So uh, when saying that the DMA is not about consumers, you know, competition scholars would say, but wait a minute, competition law is about protecting consumers. But some people are now saying that it should be indeed about protecting the market structure. Uh, and so in a sense, you're totally right in, in saying that. But, um, you know, sometimes I'm a bit puzzled to see that. In, indeed, the um, you, you know the coherence between the two is is hard to to ensure, if only because they require something different, which you just explained. And so this leads me to actually, you know, after entering the firm black box, to enter the DSA black box, and then I'm going to ask you the question to you, Matthias. But so you've published some great work when it comes to algorithmic transparency and the default rules. And so, what is your take on that? Is the DSA going in the right direction? If so, is it good enough? How can we improve? Well, so as I said before, in terms of the algorithmic transparency and explainability, um, DSA may be possibly a step in the, in the right direction um, in the sense that it very strongly emphasizes transparency of the platform economy or at least of the social media platforms as such. Um, I think the Crucial question when you think about algorithms and uh, like an attempt to somehow reopen like this black box or to, in other terms, like to civilize a little bit this this, this sphere where uh, platforms are right now enjoying almost like unlimited power in terms of personalization, in terms of processing personal data. Uh, we must wait for. Um, let's say the, the, the future fate of, of the AI regulation, because, because I think here, um, this AI regulation, which does not formally belong to this DSM, the DSA DMA package, I think is a very, I would say, direct and very closely related um, segue to, 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 to the DSA, in the sense that it, uh, in its part that refers to the protection of individuals who are, who are subjected to algorithmic decision making by some non-state actors, um, this AI regulation seems to provide like another instrument of 
protection and another instrument that tries to ensure transparency on the platform market. Uh, when it comes to, to, the, to the default rules, um, well, so my, uh, my work on default rules in the context of the platform economy was trying to look into, into this topic from the perspective of self-regulation, because what I'm very deeply convinced about at this stage is that platforms right now are playing a role of quasi-sovereign entities, as Professor Jack Bolkin from, from Yale School uh, framed it, they are they behave as special purpose sovereigns who enjoy a de facto ability to regulate particular spheres of social life and market. And they are extremely effective in this sphere. As we know, they are extremely potent because the states, the state-made regulation is very weak, is very hardly applicable to the phenomena we, we, we observe on the, in the platform economy. So, in the consequence, platforms are very deeply under-regulated. And um, therefore, this vacuum, this regulatory vacuum is, is filled in by platforms with their terms and conditions, user agreements, various pieces of internal regulation, which in fact, in many situations, are much more important for the communities of users than the state-made law on freedom of speech, hate speech, whatever else, consumer protection. And from this point of view, I think the ESA is a bit, um, a bit uh, short in terms of supplying us with, with some reactions to this phenomenon, because I think those reactions could be, um, could, be, could, be, could be twofold. So, so, so first of all, we can think about a piece of EU regulation that will try to somehow limit this self-regulatory power of platforms, and which will, will, will try to set some boundaries for what the platforms can decide enough, what they cannot decide enough, and what could be the remedies if platforms, for example, come beyond this, 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 this borderline and, for example, introduce into their terms and conditions some elements that should not be there. And of course, right now we have the, in the EU law, we have GDPR and we have the Unfair, commercial, unfair Contract Terms Directive, uh, which try, which allow for very limited control of those internal pieces of platform regulation. However, I am very deeply skeptical to what extent they are uh, like a very, like actually an effective tool in, in, in controlling this, 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 this sphere of the platform economy. And secondly, we can also think about the, like say, engaging in some kind of a dialogue with, with uh, platforms in the sense that platforms can be used as a sort of regulatory intermediaries. Mm -hmm. And this is the concept developed in the US, which I think to some extent may also apply to, 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 to what we have in Europe right now. So we can think about building upon this de facto market regulatory power of platforms in order to use them to promote certain values, certain regulatory goals, certain policy aims. And here, of course, we are, this question opens like many detailed, uh, complex questions about to what extent we can trust platforms who pursue their own interest, that they will actually pursue the, some collective goals, collective interests of the society, of the economy, and so far. Secondly, there is also the question to what extent or in, which, in what spheres we can, we can um, entrust this kind of goals in platforms instead of thinking it as st about states as the only regulators of, of, of certain spheres, such as, for example, consumer protection or non-discrimination and so far. And thirdly, there is also the question, what kind of supervision, what kind of, uh, let's say, regulatory tools we should, we, should, we should develop in this sphere in order to ensure that this regulatory dialogue between platforms and the state or the EU can actually happen in the effective way. But again, these are the questions rather than the answers, of course. And, uh, but it was a bit disappointing for me that DSA left this entire sphere completely, completely aside. Yes, thanks a lot. And you know, I could ask some more questions, um, which is one that Lawrence Lessig already 20 years ago was asking, can we trust the government also, right, to design? Um, and he was answering, 
that the answer probably is negative. But that indeed, if you, on the other end, you have to trust those platforms, then is the answer positive? Well, not so sure. So what do we do? Uh, so I just wanted to put that on the table. Um, and something which also is, I was thinking about the work of Alexandre de Stril, who was uh, sharing one of the panel in, in day one of this conference on trying to indeed work with platforms and use their power in a way to regulate, you know, starting from the idea that they actually regulate our life way more than they, what they used to do even just five years ago. And potentially they do that to a degree which is similar to, to the rule of law. Um, and, and something that you mentioned, which is interesting in terms of dynamics is that indeed, if we, you know, if the DSA is too short in trying to, to use that aspect of, of platforms to regulate, then something else, which is also could be a complement, would be to use the state power, but to modernize the state power and to use AI to enforce the DSA. I will ask a question about uh, to Eduardo on the subject, but before I want to ask Sylvia a question because I think you have a complementary expertise um, regarding especially the IoT. Uh, you recently defended your PhD on the subject. And so let me ask you the following question. The Federal Bank of St. Louis uh, published a paper, uh, an empirical work actually in uh, 16, showing that when it comes to the financial markets, depending on the size of the, the companies, the cost to be compliant is actually represents something uh, which varies to, to different degrees. So if you are a small bank, being compliant with financial regulations amounts to 7% of all of your the costs. If you are a medium bank, then it's 5%. And if you are a big bank, then being compliant is just 3%. And so my question is, and, and the same can be safe for the GDPR. We also have some empirical work so Sylvia, the question is the following, regarding the DSA and regarding what you know when it comes to IoT, do you think that it will be much easier for Amazon and Google to comply with the DSA and that therefore it will confer a competitive advantage regarding what's inside the DSA? Or do you think that this time around it might be different and actually might, may benefit the startups in the space of IoT? Um, I think it is definitely um, where the package also <laughs> becomes important. So considering the two together, uh, first of all, I have to be honest, I think it's pretty intuitive that obviously compliance costs uh, increase for uh, small and medium or micro, especially for micro enterprises. Yeah. Um, at the same time, it is a bit difficult to also expand the study that is on such a special sector like banking, to other things, but from what I've seen in the IoT domain, uh, there is definitely um, a similar mechanism. Startups especially try to develop products hoping that they will be um, taken up by one of the big companies and they try to do as little compliance as possible. They don't have the means, the cost, <laughs> the, 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 the money, nor the people to do that at the time. <laughs> At the same time, if we look at how many digital products, IoT included, the markets of many digital products, we can see that the small actors are a minimum percentage. So these are, pro these are markets that are dominated by enormous actors, or at least very big ones. <laughs> so it's clear that uh, there is an awareness of this in both the DSA and the DMA, definitely in the DSA. Uh, where um, they know who they're dealing with. They know and they want to expressly um, create a room for small and medium enterprises and micro enterprises. This is why they have a special regime for them in the DSA. So there is a basic nucleus of obligations that are uh, for all types of company. Those obligations are mostly reporting and transparency obligations. Mm -hmm. Um, also, th this is the kind of obligations that uh, we need to understand. So, sure, it's going to be uh, difficult initially. I see the obstacle to be mostly the first time, the first two years that you need to do the annual reporting. Then on mm. the third one, you have a format that's going to fly <laughs> way smoother. But um, and I can see how, in this sense, the European Union, the board that is the the, the entity that's going to be created with the DSA, need to work with national existing um, entities, like the Chamber of Commerce, there can be help desks 
to help small and medium enterprises that don't have that expertise in-house. Mm -hmm. And that coordination right now is lacking and was lacking already with the GDPR. And personally, I've been um, always advocating for it. We can use Chamber of Commerce, Association of Small and Medium Enterprises, Association of Enterprises to provide expertise to the smaller ones, smaller actors. At the same time, the bigger duties, so the right of redress, mm. uh, very intense duties of transparency and reporting, they are all for the humongous companies for which this cost is going to be maybe initially a little bit, but still going to represent a very small fraction of their yearly turnover anyway. And with the combination then with the DMA, we can actually open up space for the smaller and medium enterprises that in Europe, in most European nations, represent the vast majority of the industrial landscape. So we actually desperately need it. And I'm going to say something that might sound ominous, but right now, the biggest enterprises, the biggest actors in the platform sector are not necessarily coming from Europe. So we really need to find ways to stimulate our small and medium enterprises and to have them remain on the market in the long term, because that's what's bringing innovation for the larger society, not just entering as a startup, lasting two years or five years, then selling whatever viable product you manage to create to one of the big companies and leaving. We need these companies to create a long-term relationship with the market and a long-term relationship with the consumers. And trust, for example, which is one of the aims of the DSA, helps in that sense. And, you know, it might mean also that we may want to consider the work of economists such as Michael Kramer, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics for his work on patent buyout and, you know, governments using grants and putting something which is also creating an incentive instead of just the, the legal environment. Uh, but, you know, something that you said uh, that they, the European Commission knows, how, you know, who are, who is targeted by the DSA um, it seems to me that they have the same impression for the DMA, but I think they may be in trouble for the following reason. They say the DMA will apply to basically eight companies, right? So they would say, uh, it, we have eight sectors, um, cloud services, search engine, social media. And if you are a provider of a service in one of those sectors, and if you pass the threshold, 45 million users plus a turnover, blah, 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 then it applies to you. But then my question is the following. Can we include Tesla in the scope? Because Tesla does provide a operating system, uh, and Tesla definitely has more, I guess, I, I think, more than 45 uh, million users, right? Or, or eventually will pass the threshold. And so therefore, you could say that DMA applies to Tesla, which is creating an incentive not to integrate a operating system in, in your car if you are you know, another car manufacturer. So it's very interesting to see that the scope is, is maybe not so clear. Uh, but now I want to move on to, to you, Eduardo. You, May you, I add one yeah, thing about the course. Tesla? Sorry, sorry, Eduardo, it's where it's going to be super, super quick. Every time uh, we talk about a... Elon Musk, it's, you know, generating. No. <laughs> no, but it's a common issue also with the IoT because we have a convergence yeah. of sectors. We have the... Um, uh, companies operating some of the most famous uh, IoT devices like the smart speakers um, that power the real capabilities of these of the of the hardware. Yeah. And these companies work as a platform, but we must not confuse that the product is an interface. And in this sense, Germany issued a very clear uh, position saying things like a smart speaker, things like the smart car or the self-driving cars, they are interfaces. What's mm -hmm. behind is the service and the service is powered then by another company potentially. So but what's again, what's, yeah, and that's very interesting because again, if you read, and I'm not sure if it's the same in the DSA, but in the DMA, they would say you have to provide it doesn't say that it has to be, you know, 100% of what you do. So just providing one of those is actually good enough to be included in the scope, um, which again may mean that you include more than I think 80 companies in Europe. But <laughs> different subject for a different day. Eduardo, you, you've written a paper with uh, Vinicius, who might be listening to us, on using AI as an enforcement tool. And so that brings me to the following question, be, be, you know, whether we talk about the DSA or the three pillars that you discussed in Brazil, including the two that exist already, do you, do you foresee AI being used to enforce you know, such obligations, such as the one in the DSA, such as the one in the laws that you have in Brazil? 
And if so, is it something that is happening in Brazil as we speak? Um, what's happening in the space? What's your take on that? Is it the future or not? Well, uh, our paper discussed um, basically the inability of the current legal matrix to tackle problems within ecosystems and under AI direction, right? So this is this is something that I really strongly believe. So we, we need to think of a new uh, way to to bring effectiveness to the commands, you know. Like uh, Matteo said, you know, we we have like very weak commands, legal commands to be applied in the platform. So we are in line with this reasoning. And we propose uh, to uh, craft a new language to co combining computational programming and legal commands that's to, to mitigate deviations. Uh, but at the protocol level or using uh, the words of Thibault at the code level, right? So this I, I don't know how, to, we don't have this language so far. But this is not an abstract idea to, to bring a new code, uh, combining legal and uh, computational command. So I'm very confident that this, if we have a settlement of objectives between the many, the, the several communities uh, around the world, I mean, uh, bringing an analogy to the blockchain plus antitrust text, brilliant Thibault. Great book. Has written. Great <laughs> book, yeah. <laughs> I combine like the community, AI community, the tech community, the cypherpunk community, blockchain, and the law legal community. Uh, we can potentialize the goals of uh, diplomas like GSA, GMA, and the like, mainly GSA, right? But basically to reach a higher level of welfare. That's what we, we want. But I do believe we can use AI for sure to... Let me ask regulate. you a follow-up question. When you published that paper, how was it received in Brazil? And is that the kind of discussion that you have with your clients? Again, I, you know, it wasn't my intention to talk about your practice so much, but I think it's very interesting to see the way people react in the real space, right? So if you can yeah. answer those two sub-questions, that'll be great. Sure, sure. Actually, uh, from the last to the first one, no, I don't, I don't discuss this type of thing with the clients. And they, my clients, basically, they need a solution for a very concrete problem, you know, so. For today, yeah. Yeah, for today or for yesterday, actually. Every, yep. every time. <laughs> as as it's always for yesterday, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, and unfortunately, we don't have such a discussion in Brazil. Um, I mean, our community, academic community, or like policy makers, they are like far beyond, far behind what we need. Basically, we are, in these times, we see how we are far behind the developed world. So we have, so, uh, more like, um, I mean, uh, close to the ground problems just to face, then we don't, don't have time, we don't have uh, this the, the favorable environment to discuss it. So unfortunately, we're, we're not discussing this. So how do they receive the paper? Maybe some, some people like it, but we're not discussing this. That's okay. why we publish in English and we are trying to yeah. you know, discuss in our best environment. You know, again, we come back to this idea of the environment. And of course, as lawyers, we discuss the legal environment, but the normative environment and the political environment is also central, especially when you talk about DSA and DMA. Matthews, I, I want to come back to you as to whether you think that the DSA is technologically sound. Um, it seems to me that we could not impose in 2021 a obligation to prevent the publication of all illegal content because the, the, it, it might be easy, right, to, if that's something clearly racist, I could see how the algorithm could detect that. But sometimes it's a bit more tricky. And I, and I see why you can't say to all companies you have to prevent it. And it seems to me that the idea of saying you have to do the best you can to detect the content and then you take it down is actually sound when the DMA potentially is not that you know, sound. But I'm curious to, as to whether you agree with that idea. And if, if so... Would you say that in just a few years from now, when algorithms are going to improve and the ability to detect legal content is going to improve before publication, do you think that what, what should we do with the DSA then? Should we just amend the DSA? Should we have something different? How do you see you know, the interplay between different regulations depending on the tech evolution? 
Well, so I think there are two layers to this question. So the first of them is a question about the technological soundness of DSA as such, because of course, right now we are certainly unable to, to um, devise an algorithm that will be able to detect all the hate speech or fake news or any other unwanted content online and to do it with like a high certainty in the sense that we'll yeah. no longer use a human factor or we'll no longer use at least a substantial involvement of human factor in this decision-making process. And as you all know, right now, most of the social media platforms, they use algorithms in order to somehow like pre-filter the content yeah. on the on the website. But uh, at the end of the day, there is a human being that is uh, making the decision whether particular, uh, I don't know, photo, whether particular post on Facebook or on Twitter is or is not uh, against the rules of the community of, of this platform, basically. So yeah, so, so at this point, I think the DSA simply tries to respond to the state of the art in the development of algorithms that we have. And, and from this perspective, it is technologically sound. Uh, we, may, we may call it this way. And whether in the future, more or less remote future, we can, we can think about the algorithm that will be able to replace this human mm -hmm. brain, human assessment to a higher extent, yeah, perhaps yes. Perhaps, like for sure, we can we can think about the algorithms that will be more and more sensitive and that will be more and more capable of uh, detecting various kinds of unwanted content and distinguishing between some types of content in those kind of like borderline situations where we, for example, have something that can be qualified as right or as wrong from the perspective of, I don't know, defamation or from the perspective of, of uh, abuse of some basic ethical standards. However, um, I think there is another question. Here comes the second layer of, 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 um, of the problem I mentioned before. So I think in order to have such an algorithm, we do not only need to have a, like a well-developed technology, but we also have to have a well-developed consent of what we consider to be unwanted content and what, what not. Yeah. And uh, as you may know, the Facebook tried to, like, this is the big problem of Facebook. Um, and then Facebook has been struggling with this for years. And one of the solutions to this question, to this problem that Facebook was trying to promote was creation of this, as Mark Zuckerberg called it, the Supreme Court of Facebook. So the Facebook Oversight Board, yeah. which is going to be this like superior body that will uh, define what is admissible and what is prohibited uh, within the community of the Facebook users. And as you know, one of the main problems with this with this body is that it's composed mostly of the American scholars and American policymakers, American American politicians also to some extent, also with the involvement of people from different parts of the world, with from Europe, from Central Europe, from Western Europe, from Africa, from Asia, and so far. However, many commentators raise this doubt to what extent this Facebook Oversight Board will be able to devise a standard that will somehow reflect the average understanding of, for example, what is the, I don't know, uh, the content that should be not uh, permitted to be presented to children, for example, on Facebook and so far. And to what extent it will simply, it will be a device of somehow like transplanting or exporting a central, uh, certain, sorry, a concept of, of, of freedom of speech, of, of freedom of expression, uh, based or rooted in the, in the American perception of this, of this issue along the network of the users of, of, of Facebook. So here we are coming to, I think, the core question that Facebook and the other platforms that operate globally, they operate in various cultural contexts. So in order to have 
the operational algorithm of the kind you, you, you mentioned in your question, mm -hmm. I think we also need to find a plausible way to somehow mitigate those cultural differences and to find a common denominator. But how, I, how do we do that? Challenge. How do we do that? Do you have any clue? Let's say you are Mark Zuckerberg tomorrow, or let's say the CEO of Facebook. <laughs> what, how do you, what do you do? Where do you start to reach that you know, common understanding? Well, so I, at the very beginning, I was quite positive about the idea of this Facebook oversight board. As long as uh, I believed it will be much more culturally diversified. And also, as long as I believe that, or of course, I was a bit skeptical, but I think I was, I was maybe a bit idealizing this idea at the very beginning, because I thought it may indeed lead to building, construing this kind of a common denominator for the community of, of, of Facebook users. Although in the course of time, it, it turned out that uh, this Facebook oversight board does not, is not really treated by, by, by Facebook as, a, as an aid in, 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 uh, in this endeavor, to put it broadly, but rather as a kind of like a foreign object uh, that should be, that, is, that poses a threat for Facebook. And uh, as you may know, in this Facebook, a part of this Facebook leak um, affair, when, 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 um, like many internal papers of, 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 of Facebook were revealed to the public in the US, like in, in September, uh, a part of this was also the question about the relationship, the, the attitude of Facebook towards the, this Facebook oversight board, where I think it turned out quite, quite clearly that Facebook is trying to hide some information from the, from the oversight board, is trying to play some certain games with, 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 with this oversight board, which again puts this endeavor under like a huge question mark for me. So okay. I don't so you know would if say any... diversity one, and then, you know, some sort of procedure behind the board, right? To ensure this. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Um, now I do have a question for you three. And I'm going to ask you to be very precise, and you'll see how. But I, I want to come back to this idea of bigness, because it's, it seems that the more competition, the more fake news, right? Because the more companies trying to attract your attention, to capture your attention. Uh, and also, you could say the more targeted advertising, the less privacy. And so it seems that the negotiation regarding the DSA and also in the AI Act, they are leading towards this idea of you know, hampering targeted advertising for reasons that we understand. But in the meantime, we do also have some empirical work uh, showing that the more personalized content, including targeted advertising, the better it is for competition, because it means that the small players can actually target the niche market and if they can't access to the niche market, they will die versus the big tech. And so it seems, although this is not always the case, but that sometimes, and this is the case here, there is a trade-off between privacy on the, on the one hand and competition on the other. And my question to you is, what do we do? So if you do have a scale in which you are a you know, fundamentalist for privacy or a fundamentalist for competition, where do we put the needle? And I will start with you, Sylvia, answering this one. Um, I would definitely put it a little bit more towards privacy, but I am partial <laughs> as I am mostly a privacy and data protection um, a professional. But I do think it's important to consider that targeted advertising needs to be separated in terms of regulating it from regulating the market of targeted advertising. Because the vast majority of the market that has grown on top of the technology that allows targeted advertising and the idea of targeted advertising is predatory in nature. And as things stay right now, they are expressly and very uh, knowingly in violation on many European regulations, but the market is big. There is a very interesting report from a few years ago from Digital Content Next, which is the trade association of content creators in the United States of America and includes creators like 
the New York Times, <laughs> so big content creators. Like we're not talking, you know, indie illustrators. We're talking huge companies. Their report showed how the structure of the market and the various intermediaries that had, for example, Google at its center was actually strangling big companies like the New York Times because the profit was not coming from the targeted advertising. That made targeted advertising less valuable for them. And they were even thinking to go back to just normal television and newspapers yeah. because they were putting a lot of money also for that. So what I really think is that what's being hampered, hopefully, <laughs> what should be hampered by regulation is the predatory practice, not the technology of targeted advertising, because the predatory practice hurts the small companies way more than the big ones. It hurts the, the public. It makes them lose trust. So overall, I actually want to improve the market that's built on top of targeted advertising because yep. we want to bring back the utility of it. That's a beautiful way to answer the question. So both, right? <laughs> better competition with better targeted advertising. You know, you mentioned the Times. Recently, the, it was revealed that... Uh, what the New York Times is doing, and I've been a long time subscriber, uh, so I didn't know I was subjected to to this practice, but they had a group. Um, no, actually, they used a group called D Data Science Group who created a machine learning system to detect the emotions that articles will evoke. And according to that, apparently, the Times was using those techniques to, you know, put out paper that would make people angry because this is better, of course. And we've seen that, you know, with Donald Trump subscriptions went up. So th this is quite fascinating to see that although a newspaper might be criticizing the big tech for using some of the techniques, you see that they use not so distant <laughs> similar techniques. Um, so worse very, techniques. <laughs> most techniques, indeed. Worse, way worse. <laughs> With emotion maybe, detection, I draw the yeah, line. <laughs> could, be, could be that big tech is doing the same, but who knows. Um, so Eduardo, now, uh, before I go back to a privacy type of scholar. <laughs> Let me give the word to you, Eduardo. And if you say privacy, it means that, you know, this will be the anonymous vote. So where do you draw the line between those two objectives? Well, it's a nice question. I, it, and I would follow, I would follow Sylvia in chosen both, but of course, uh, towards competition, right? To respect my origin. <laughs> but actually, uh, what I see is that we should we should have a, a we should craft a new regulation that we cannot use the old regulation to tackle this problem. It's uh, you know not effective at all. I mean this is an anonymity I think between us. But well, of course we should try to. Uh, this is a basically I just written a, p a paper with Julian and another professor that's um, targeting this intersection between this uh, privacy, consumer protection law, and antitrust law, right? Because it reaches. These, these three levels, these three spheres, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But um, but of course, we should try to uh, to regulate and to curb predatory practices at all. But when it goes to competition arena, predatory practices are like a, a too broad concept. So maybe sometimes uh, you will curb a predatory practice. It's not so predatory, but it's like destroying a competitor, but enhancing another and raising uh, the consumer welfare very much. So I would classify this predatory practice and I would uh, temper uh, the intervention tar to target like fake stuff, you know, fake or false or, uh, or malicious, right? Mm -hmm. That's uh, the, the way that I see that we can protect privacy, protect uh, uh, civil rights or personal rights, and still uh, leave the players uh, to fight for the best position in terms of winning the competition, right? So I just recall, uh, if you may, if I may, Chibo, I will ask about the practice. And after responding, no, not at all. Uh, I have two, two different clients, different sectors. Then they, they are building up platforms. And uh, I recall to, we are trying to build up a open access platforms, API, friendly APIs. And we are betting that as long as they can use the platform to uh, enhance their business, all sides, mm. and no, and do not make profit on the platform itself, they will win the competition in the future. Yeah. You know, um, I spent the night reading the Google Shopping case by the general court, and it does say that 
if you have an open platform, then you cannot discriminate, kind of, if you are a kind of essential facility, whatever that means. But it also says that if you have a closed platform, then it's perfectly okay for you to do so. So in terms of incentive, I'm not too sure this is what we want to do. Before I give you the floor, Matthias, I'm curious as to whether any of you has ever bought something using personalized advertising. I can say that I do that on a regular basis. Am I the only one? It looks like it. Sylvia, Matthias, Eduardo, you never bought anything out of targeted advertising. Is that right? Okay. Uh, probably no. have. I should think about it. I'm sure that through so. Instagram, I ha I must have bought something that was the result of some form of targeted advertising. Uh, you know, me again. too, for sure. Me too, for sure. Yeah? Okay. Matthias, yeah, no. So I, cannot, I cannot exclude it, although I cannot also recall any particular instance. But okay. it's highly likely. Yeah. It's not you know, I was somehow not inspired or anchored by, by, by the particular uh, kind of like commercial I, advertisement I, I saw online somewhere. Yeah. If I go on Instagram, I will get lots of vinyls and great music. So I do that on a regular basis. But, you know, talking about infrastructure, it's also very interesting to see that when we talk about a closed infrastructure, such as the one here in th that phone, then it, I cannot prevent targeted advertising, which is something that I can do on a computer. So you see also the role of design, which is something that we all touch upon today. Uh, but Matthias, the, the same question for you, where do you draw the line between perfect privacy, whatever that means, and perfect competition, although we prefer imperfect competition, but which objective you think is most important if there are trade-offs? Hmm. So, if there are trade-offs, indeed, uh, I think I would go for for competition. So, so a bit against my own roots. I think in 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 um, consumer protection or privacy protection. But I think this is the sphere which uh, has a stronger bearing, stronger impact on how personal data is, is processed, how personal data is handled by, 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 by big tech companies. Uh, although I also, and I think I can, I can um, concur with Eduardo on this, I do not see that any like actual trade-offs in this sphere actually uh, occur and will occur in, in, in the future, or at least that should occur in the future, because we never know how the regulation will develop. Because I think what we what we have now is that we have the big competition question, which is mostly the question supported by the data question. So by the question how the competitors on the online market are gathering data, what they do about this data, how they address consumers using the knowledge they have about, about those consumers uh, that was previously accrued from the market. And I don't think that at least if we if we use the current conceptual and analytical framework for the platform economy, where we build links between the market power and the and data, so so the the capacity of, of, of the particular platform to gather data, to process this data. I don't think we, we speak about two separate issues. So I don't think we we can sacrifice privacy protection for the sake of competition protection or the other way around. Mm. I think so so this needle, yes, on the scale, I think should be put somewhere in between. Or maybe, and here I, I also like very much what Eduardo said, maybe we should just think about a new scale where we will not have those like two extreme points like competition and then privacy, but something completely else because, and this is something I, I can see quite clearly from the perspective of, of a topic I've been working upon for, uh, for the past few months, which is the personalized pricing mm. in the economy, where we can clearly see that the classical framework and the classical instruments of analysis and, and regulation of, of pricing practices on the consumer market are completely inoperable when we think about, about personalized pricing and when we think about the kind of threats or the kind of uh, possible infringements of consumer interests, of competitors' interests that may occur in, in, in this sphere. So 
I think we can, we can, we should think about like a completely new way of approaching this kind of topics, which will merge, which will try to somehow, somehow hybridize privacy protection and, and consumer slash competition protection. So yeah, I see. Thank you very much that all of you have used the trick of Schopenhauer in trying to answer the question, not by answering the question. Uh, and I very much this, this idea of, you know, a different scale. Uh, and indeed, it might be that, you know, if you want to consider blockchain, you see that there is more competition and it might be better for privacy. Uh, but uh, this leads me to the very final question, because we only have 10 minutes left. And now the time comes for me to ask you the most important question, which is the following. And please, uh, we will do Sylvia first, then uh, Mateus, and then Eduardo. My question is the following. What is the most important question that I failed to ask you regarding the DSA? And can you then please answer the question? Sylvia, um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, that's a great question. No one ever asked it in a panel, so amazing. <laughs> Um, I would say that um, why isn't um, the uh, DSA borrowing some terms from the DMA? Uh, and the most important one that uh, I would say the DSA should borrow from the DMA is gatekeeper, mm. because it's a very common concept with the markets. But we need to understand that if there are uh, information gatekeepers that reflects in how information are uh, consumed and perused by the users and that affects their fundamental rights so why haven't they using both aren't they using both the term gatekeeper that would immediately give an idea also into the essay i would do that <laughs> and so that's the question and do you have any clue as to why they haven't used it i think I think they it, it might be too evocative for a piece of legislation, or it all of a sudden might shake things up a little bit too much. But um, still, they're, worth, they're, yeah. I think so. And they're using a lot of new terms with the AI Act. They, we have the operators. So why not? Yeah. All right. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Um, yes, Matthews. It was a very tricky question, but I. I would say, like, first question I could that I think should be asked here was was definitely the the question by Sylvia. So 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 the question about about the interlinks between DSA and DMA. But I think there's also another pending question that uh, should be definitely asked in this sphere. So it's the question about the transatlantic perspective of what we are talking about, because uh, definitely the problem of online platforms is not only the European problem, but it's also primarily the US European problem. So we cannot think about the European regulation without looking into how the platform economy is developing in the US and how the US government is trying to regulate the sphere. And uh, it's not only about, about the Brussels effect. So it's not only about this somehow like radiation of, of, of the EU created rules upon, upon the, the US market practice, but it's also the question about, first of all, the synergy. So whether and to what extent the European Union is, is interested in, in building some kind of common understanding or common policy denominator uh, with the US government. And as we know right now, Joe Biden is quite deeply invested in, in, um, in developing the digital market policy in the US. And the Federal Trade Commission right now put this with the new head, who is Lina Khan, put this, this, this objective like on top of its political agenda. And secondly, there is also a question to what extent we can think about some not only political, but also legal solutions uh, at the transnational level. Uh, so, so to what extent we are interested in regulating Facebook or Amazon or Google only in Europe as such, and to what extent, which of course, as we know, is territorially limited, is limited in terms of scope, and to what extent we, we are ready to start uh, something more uh, overarching, at least uh, in terms of the European-US uh, cooperation. And let me you know, complicate the question a bit. What if we put China into the mix? What, what's the impact of all that? 
I think nobody knows at this at this point because the it seems that the Chinese policy is quite mixed and can be sometimes quite surprising because uh, for a long time it seemed that China was quite um, I would say liberal in terms of in terms of its its own uh, platforms also the platforms with some US or European reach like for example Alibaba mm. but, uh, as you know, recently, like a few months ago, there was a big shift in the in the, in the Chinese policy towards towards Chinese big tech platforms, and uh, it seems that uh, China can be also a partner in this in this dialogue uh, or trialogue if we if we if we think about the U.S. as well. Although it seems to me that the political goals or economic goals of the of the Chinese regulators can be quite quite departed from uh, the US and, and, and European problems which are more or less grouped along the same lines so we are in the US and in Europe think about those problems in similar ways I think in China because of the political specificity because of the economic specificity specificity of this country and um, the kind of Questions they are trying to ask themselves at the political and legal level are quite are quite different. But uh, well, I think this kind of discussion, this kind of dialogue, is also very likely to begin in the future. Yeah, and I think indeed, as you said, it's very important to keep in mind the difference, you know, in terms of political agenda. I've seen people on Twitter, you know, uh, saying that the Chinese actions was great and that it was a model for us in Europe because they were tough regarding the big tech. But, you know, you also have to consider the context in which they do all that. Um, Eduardo, the floor is yours. You have the final words. So what is the most important question that I failed to ask? And can you please answer the question? Well, it you, you never fails. You never fail. So <laughs> congratulations. Actually, no, if I could, if I could uh, put, add another question, I would. Uh, I have a similar reasoning than Matteo's, and but I would. I would. I would make it a little larger, a little broader. This is not a, a bilateral problem. It's like a global problem. So, uh, the question I would raise is whether it's not the case to you know enhance and make a little bit uh, effect uh, better the regulation or more precise uh, the European regulation, and why not? Uh, to suggest like a, a, a like in making it a little broader to to reach a multilateral level, you know, and giving the countries the opportunity to opt in or to join the discussion and to uh, adhere to such a regulation, you know, maybe this is this would bring bring more effectiveness to the debate and to the the provisions because uh, we. I mean, talking about not only Brazil, but Latin American countries, African countries, and other countries all over the world where these platforms are or have reached, uh, will be affected uh, by any sort of regulation or uh, governance standard, right? Mm -hmm. And in the end of the day, we're talking about uh, personal rights, and people are all over the world. So we're not thinking much or lately about this setting up a regulation or as, at least. A, a like a global command or list of commands to this uh, phenomenon, right? So we come back to this issue of world uh, coherence. And so, I mean, thank you so much for making this um, panel so informative. I hope for the regulators. I was also thinking all along that it, 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 thank you very much for making such a great teaching material. Um, I think we addressed some of the hard questions. Um, so uh, I hope that everyone enjoyed watching us and now is the time to say goodbye i will see most of you in uh, i guess uh, 45 minutes for a keynote with bill kovacic but until then thank you so much silvia mateus and, and eduardo and i'll see you very soon bye-bye thank you my pleasure bye-bye bye-bye <laughs> thank you thank you